The displays and the optics inside modern virtual reality headsets are some of the most complex components humanity has ever built. And yet both Apple and Meta agree that they're still nowhere near good enough. In 2010, Apple introduced a brilliant new marketing term. Something we call the retina display. Instead of giving consumers a count of how many pixels their screen had and letting them do the mental math of figuring out what that actually means, Retina is simply a stamp of approval that says that the display is sharp enough and that you won't see individual pixels on it at all. Today, every single product on Apple's website from the $329 iPad all the way to the $5,000 monitors all carry the Retina label. All except the Vision Pro. In fact, despite featuring 23 million pixels or more than six times as many as even a modern iPhone, the Vision Pro is still only about halfway to having actual retina resolution. And meanwhile, other VR headsets are, of course, even further. And similarly, despite Apple's display panels already outputting a mind-boggling 5,000 nits of brightness, less than 100 of those nits, or about 2%, ever actually reach the user. This means that the actual experience is a little bit dim, if anything, and the displays can't show proper HDR either. Now, despite all of this, I'm actually a believer in this technology, not because the headsets today are perfect, but rather because I've seen so much progress being done already and because I've seen many, many exciting things in the pipeline for the future as well. So in this video, let's talk about the fascinating evolution of VR displays and optics. This video was sponsored by Insta360. More about them at the end. This is perhaps the simplest way to make a VR headset. We have a pair of lenses, and then my phone pretends to be two different displays, so we can have one image per eye. And we need to show two different scenes to fool our brain and the eyes into thinking that we're actually looking at a 3D scene. Our eyes help us see everything from two slightly different perspectives, and you can test this yourself. Hold the finger up, hold it close to you, and if you close one eye and then the other, then it will jump around quite a bit. If you move it further away and do the same, then that jumping will become much, much smaller. Our brains can use this information to automatically guess the distance of basically all the objects that we see, and then to create a sort of 3D map of the world. And so on our headset, having two different displays allows us to show virtual scenes from two different perspectives too, which then allows us to achieve the illusion of 3D. Now the displays are actually way closer than anything that our eyes could focus on naturally, and so to help, we also add lenses, which simply move the whole focus distance as if the screen was about two meters or six feet away from us. And so once you can focus and also perceive things in 3D, we have a very basic VR experience. Now, of course, modern headsets have become way more complicated than that by now. And to explain what I mean, let's take a look at their lenses. This is a basic lens and it bends light by making light waves pass from one material to another at an angle. But this design makes for a pretty bulky lens. So how could we fix that? Well, the actual bending happens right at the surface of the lens, which means that the majority of the glass is basically dead weight. And so to get rid of that, we've developed so-called Fresnel lenses. Here we cut the lens into segments, we remove the excess material, and we create a radically thinner and lighter lens. The light rays that pass through it still hit the edge of the glass at the same angle as before, so the focusing still works, but the lens is now much lighter and much thinner. Fresnel lenses are popular in lighthouses, where they allow us to have gigantic lenses without using literally tons and tons of glass. And they're also popular in VR headsets like the MetaQuest 2, where you can see all the little rings if you look closely. The downside of this technique is that you can get a little bit of light scattering where the cuts are made, which then results in the infamous god rays that you might have seen if you've used VR before. But Fresnel lenses do work and they're still pretty popular. Now, another traditional problem in VR is that the lens also needs to be a certain distance away from the screen so that the focusing can actually work, which then leaves loads of empty space. Shrinking this space is what so-called pancake optics or folded optics are for, and you can see how effective this shrinking can be on this comparison photo by iFixit. Apple and Meta have both fully embraced pancake optics on their new headsets, and here's the basic idea of how these work. You add two lenses in front of the screen, one of which gets coated to be a semi-transparent mirror, while the other will let light with some polarization through, but will actually reflect others. On top of these, there are also two layers that can change the polarization of light as it passes through. 
Okay, so the screen emits the light for our image, and then half of that can pass through the 50-50 mirror lens. That light then continues to the second lens, which initially reflects it back, because currently it is polarized the wrong way. But once the light makes a round trip through the system, its polarization gets changed a couple of times until it can pass through the second time to then land in the user's eye. This whole back and forth creates an optical path that still has the same length as before, and you also have these curved surfaces that do the actual bending, but now the path is folded over itself, which saves us a lot of space. This allows us to create a much thinner headset, it moves the weight closer to our face, and it is almost single-handedly responsible for the Quest 3 being 40% thinner overall than the Quest 2. So that's great, but the Pancake Optics also have a major downside. They actually lose a massive amount of light on the way. Just that first lens alone, which we've turned into a semi-transparent mirror, loses 50% of the light both times it is used. That is a 75% light loss in total, so LCD screens can get a maximum of 20 to maybe 25% of their light through it. But even worse, OLED screens actually emit unpolarized light by default, but of course these lenses need polarized light to even work in the first place, so you also need to add an extra polarizer up front that eats up another 65% or so. This means that for OLED screens, their final efficiency is something closer to 10%. Compare that to Fresnel lenses, for example, letting over 90% of the light through, and you can now understand the trade-off. The PlayStation VR 2 with Fresnel lenses can output a very respectable 265 nits with a pretty basic screen, but in exchange it is way bulkier than the Quest 3 and the Vision Pro, despite those two actually also housing an entire computer right on your face. Meanwhile, the Quest and the Vision Pro might be thinner, but both also struggle to hit 100 nits, even despite having much, much brighter screens. It's a real trade-off, and yet for standalone headsets at least, I'm pretty convinced that pancake optics are going to be the way forward. And the reason for that is a revolution in new display technologies. So historically, headsets have used pretty generic OLED and LCD screens, but lately a new type of display called Micro OLED appeared as the next generation technology. Micro OLED screens have been used as camera viewfinders for many years, which is why Sony, with its large camera business, has historically dominated their production, but now they're clearly taking over the VR space too. They first popped up in an enthusiast headset called the Big Screen Beyond, and then in the Apple Vision Pro. Sony has since confirmed that their next VR headset will have them too. Samsung acquired the leading US micro OLED maker called Imagine for $218 million last year, and the Chinese display giant BOE says that they have some micro OLED screens ready for production too. Basically, everyone agrees that this is the next big thing for VR displays, and one quick look at their spec sheets easily tells us why. Micro OLEDs can get insanely high resolutions, more than double that of high-end LCD screens, even though they're much smaller as well. Their pixel response times can go even below one millisecond, and at 5,000 nits, even current-gen displays can get crazy bright, while Samsung and Imagine have even shown that their next-generation screens will go over 15,000 nits. And that is of course on top of all the regular benefits of OLEDs, like perfect blacks, really high contrast ratios, etc. This is clearly the next gen tech, and here's how it works on a basic level. In traditional OLED screens, we place both the diodes, aka the things that actually light up, and their control electronics onto a piece of glass. Meanwhile, in micro OLEDs, we instead build the electronics right into a chip called a silicon backplane and deposit the diodes right on top of that. And because we've gotten ridiculously good at miniaturizing chips, we can fit a mind-boggling number of transistors and pixels on these. Fun fact, Apple reportedly designed their own silicon backplane for the Vision Pro and then had TSMC manufacture it and then had Sony build their OLED tech on top of that. So in a way, Apple is now at least partially making their own displays for the first time ever, which is pretty wild. Anyway, while these micro OLEDs are absolute game changers, there are still three clear areas in which they are not quite perfect yet. First, they are, of course, extremely expensive for now, with estimates ranging between $456 and $700 for just the two displays of the Vision Pro. That is more than most VR headsets cost altogether, and we're just talking about displays here. And the second potential problem is that even at 5,000 nits, 
they might still not be bright enough. As I said in the intro, only about 2% of those 5000 nits actually make it to your eye. Of course, we now know that pancake optics already bring us down to 10%, but for the rest, you can mostly blame something called low persistence. And here's how that works. Our headsets fake motion by showing us many pictures in a quick succession, same as basically any other video. The Vision Pro can show about 100 frames per second, which sounds like a lot, but the human eye is very sensitive to motion, so ideally for the perfect illusion, you'd need at least 500, but ideally a thousand of those frames. And we're just nowhere near that. So especially if you moved your head quickly, you would notice that each frame was staying on for five to 10 times too long, which you would perceive as a weird sort of motion blur, which is one of the many, many things that make people sick in VR. And since we can't match even the bare minimum of 500 Hertz, we have to employ a trick. And that trick is that we only show each image for 10 to maybe 20% of each frame at most, and then we switch to black for the rest. In the brief moment when the image is visible, it looks all right, and then your brain magically fills in the rest. The shorter you show the image, the better the clarity, but of course, you're now just showing black, so everything looks darker. Based on the fact that we can still see a little bit of smearing in the Vision Pro, I think Apple chose the kind of minimum of 20% there. Combine that with the 10% efficiency of our pancake optics, and you now have a total of only 2% of the light passing through. 2% of 5000 nits is 100 nits, which is more or less what we see on the Vision Pro. This is a pretty brutal ratio, and if you think about it, it means that 5000 nits is really the minimum here. If you wanted a display that you could see at 300 nits, for example, while also showing you frames at 10% of the time to reduce the smearing even further, you'd have to increase the brightness sixfold to an insanely bright 30,000 nits. Now, micro OLED screens at Sony have increased their brightness tenfold over the last few years, so maybe that is possible in the relatively near future, but it's gonna be a challenge for sure. Okay, and problem number three is that even though the resolution of these screens is incredible, it is somehow not high enough either. So Apple itself defines a retina display as one that offers roughly 60 pixels per degree. This means that if a screen can show you at least 60 pixels across anywhere in a one degree of your vision, you shouldn't be able to make them out as individual pixels anymore, and the screen will just look perfectly sharp. Now, 40 pixels per degree are roughly equivalent to watching a 1080p monitor at a normal distance, and that I think is kind of the floor for being really productive and comfortable. But meanwhile in VR, these are the numbers that our most modern headsets have today. You'll notice that the Apple Vision Pro is way ahead of everyone else, and yet even it is pretty far away from Retina and not even in a 1080p monitor territory. And that is despite Apple squeezing its pixels into a narrower field of view than many of its competitors. So we're still pretty far from actual Retina resolution, but if you try the headset, it does feel surprisingly sharp. How is this possible? According to the optics expert Carl Gutak, whose fantastic tests I've linked to down below, Apple actually tricks your eye in two different ways. First, they intentionally set the screen to be just very slightly out of focus using their lenses. You can see this happening with these fantastic side-by-side -side images with the MetaQuest 3, and this blur hides the pixelation of VR displays quite convincingly. Now, the downside, of course, is that you end up losing so much detail that the Quest 3 then becomes technically sharper in many ways, but Apple then uses trick number two to make up for that. They artificially add font weights to make text appear bolder, they add thickness to lines that isn't there, they artificially increase the contrast in scenes, etc. In other words, they fake detail on basically the operating system level. That is philosophically really weird, and of course everything being just slightly out of focus is one of the things that actually contributes to people having eye strain in VR, so there's that downside to that, but I guess the illusion generally works, and people seem to think everything looks sharper than it actually does. Now, I should say here that pixels per degree is an imperfect measure of VR devices, because the lens over the display complicates things a lot. For example, headsets can often stretch the center of the image over loads of pixels, which the lens then compresses to the right size, so the part of the image that you most often look at actually appears to be sharper than a display normally would allow. While on the other hand, lens distortions also eat up a lot of clarity, so in the end you might also end up seeing less detail than the display itself would allow. 
So these PPD numbers are more of a rough measure, but just for fun, I did actually do a calculation that if you wanted to get a true retina display at 60 pixels per degree, you would need three times as many pixels as you have on the current Vision Pro. And if you also wanted to stretch that out to a more generous 120 degrees of field of view, you would then need 51 million pixels per eye, which would then be four and a half times of even what the Vision Pro has today. And that would have to run off of a battery and on a chip that is literally on your face. So yeah, the perfect display is still quite some time away. So that's where high-end VR is today. And this technology is going to continue and evolve, but there's of course also the chance that something completely different, some completely new technology will replace it or kind of leapfrog it in the future. And to illustrate what I mean, I want to show you one thing that Meta really seems to believe in. The company has long said that they're working really hard on holographic lenses. And this is a research prototype that the company showed off in 2021. Now this only has the display and the optics in it, not the whole computer, but notice how insanely thin it is. And that's because they replaced all the glass lenses with a hologram. That's right, a holographic lens. If you want to understand how holograms work in general, I've linked to a link down in the description, but for our purposes, you can just think of a hologram as kind of like a 3D photo. You make a 3D snapshot of a real life scene, and then you store that on a thin film. You can move the film around and you can see different parts of the 3D object captured on this film. So if the thing that you take this 3D snapshot of is a lens, then the hologram that you create with this snapshot will also act like a lens. This company shows off that even with their pretty cheap DIY kit, you can make holographs of scenes with lenses in them, and then you can see that the lens inside the hologram distorts the light in the same way that the real one did in the original scene. So Meta places a hologram of a lens in the headset and then gets something that looks this ridiculously compact and light. Like this is the display and this is the holographic lens and that's it. That is just mind blowing to me. And Meta says that they could even bake prescriptions into the lenses as well by just taking photos of 3D snapshots of many, many different lenses that have all the various combinations. And so you could order a headset that could arrive to you and it would have the perfect vision correction built in already without even having to add inserts or anything. This is a 3D render that Meta made to show what a fully functioning headset made with real existing parts and even eye tracking and an outer screen could be shrunk down to using holographic lenses and boy does that look wild. Meta has been pretty realistic in the past about what technologies they projected for their VR future, so I guess it's real. And based on their various statements, my estimate is that we're maybe three, four years from this being in real headsets. So if you thought that the crazy VR train was stopping anytime soon, then I think the answer is that it's dead. Definitely not. Okay, if you enjoyed the last 20 minutes or so of me talking about VR optics and displays, then I think it's pretty safe to say that you're the type of person who enjoys learning where the bleeding edge of consumer tech is today. And if that's the case, then I think you'll really enjoy this one too. This is the Insta360 Ace Pro, an action camera that is about as high-tech as a camera can get today. I took it with me on a trip recently where I put it through the torture test of scuba diving with it down to over 30 meters, among other things, and the results were really impressive. Filming a dive is a huge challenge because the deeper you go, the darker and less colorful everything looks, which is why divers usually have big rigs with huge lights like this. But I just took this little guy in its dive case, I put it in full auto mode, and it turned out some really impressive shots just on its own. You just point and shoot and you have great footage. Of course, the camera is an absolute pleasure to be used outside of water as well, and even at night where something called pure video mode can automatically optimize night scenes with the right amount of noise reduction, clarity, and more. So what magic is Insta360 using to make their image quality this good? Well, to start with, there's a massive 1 over 1.3 inch image sensor that is bigger than what you'll find on even most high-end phones and way bigger than that of the GoPro, for example. Plus, it's also paired with really high quality optics co-engineered with Leica. And the camera is also surprisingly smart with a state-of-the-art 5 nanometer AI chip that powers algorithms that analyze the footage and apply the right denoising and color enhancements real time. I've spent hundreds of hours color grading underwater footage, and I usually can't get it to look as good as this camera can get it automatically. You have 60 meters of water resistance in the case, and 10 meters even without the case, and that is despite this fantastic flip-up touchscreen. This makes filming yourself or anyone else at an odd angle so much easier, and together with the magnetic quick-release mount, it turns this action camera into easily the most convenient form factor out there. I also find it super convenient that you can stop and start recordings with simple hand gestures, and also that 
that you can cancel and pause recordings to save some space. That is really smart. And just for fun, you can even apply AI warp effects to your footage to make you look extra swanky in just a few taps. It's a truly unique experience, and the first 20 people who buy an Ace Pro with my link will get an 11% discount on the product and also a free screen protector. So check them out, I hope you have fun with it, and I'll see you in the next video.